Hello and uh, hello everybody and welcome um, after the lunchtime. Maybe your belly is full and uh, you're a little bit um, tired, but I hope you're going to enjoy my talk about Java and Azure. Um, we're going to talk about how to deploy Java apps on Azure and uh, I'm going to share some tips and tricks that uh, we at Porsche Informatica found out while deploying apps on Azure. So first, let's talk about me a little bit. Um, I'm a software engineer at, um, at Porsche Informatik in Salzburg, Austria. We're a big company, um, around 700 developers developing software for the Volkswagen Group and um, building mostly business applications for selling, reselling, and everything around the vehicle. We don't build software in the vehicle, we just build software around the vehicle. Um, I developed web apps in Java since 1999. Um, I started at Porsche Informatik there um developing our first web framework um did some internationalization there and yeah i'm, I'm i i know java very well <laughs> um you can find my code um especially later on github here um i tweeted um also at drq and um my talks are also my on dev so just uh, remember d-e-r-k-o-e and uh, you'll find me on the interwebs okay so let's dive in um the first thing i want to talk about is how to deploy apps to azure especially java apps but um what i'm talking about today is also around other apps like uh, python or or ruby or whatever i think most of the of the of the things i'm saying um, also adapts to to other platforms um .NET is maybe a little bit special because .NET uh, also has always has a special a place in the Microsoft uh, environment, but uh, for all the other platforms, I, I think it's quite the same. So let's see which platforms are there. And there are a lot of app platforms uh, in the Azure environment where you can uh, deploy apps to. First of all, you can deploy to virtual machines. That's clear. That's every every cloud has it, and um, um, you can always deploy on a on a on a host. Um, the next thing we have is app service, which is um, all, already a quite old service, and but um, it was modernized, modernized over time. And um, in the new days, you can deploy nearly everything to um, app service. Um, sometimes it's also called web apps because Funct Azure Functions is also called kind of app service. Um, then we have container instances. I think there exist around like five or six years um, where you can just deploy one container. Um, the new one, Container Apps, there was a talk um, um, like two hours ago um, about how to deploy the Container App. It's a very, a very new service. Um, it's in preview currently, and it has some rough edges still, but I think um, it uh, will be quite good for the future. Um, then you have Azure Functions um, serverless. Um, we also saw a talk about Rust in Azure Functions. You can also do Java in Azure Functions. And uh, then you have the special service for Java, Azure Spring Cloud. Uh, it's especially um, adopted for the for the Spring framework for the Java, one of the biggest Java frameworks there is. And it has special features um, around uh, this area, like a configuration server and other stuff that uh, that is in the Spring ecosystem and uh, that works quite well there. Um, then we have another service called Service Fabric. It's um, already quite old. Um, and a lot of uh, services in Azure depend on Azure uh, Service Fabric, I heard. Um, and you can use it uh, to deploy um, uh, different apps there. And then we have the two Kubernetes offerings, AKS and ARO. As, uh, that means Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Red Hat OpenShift. Um, these are both uh, Kubernetes distributions. Um, one, one of them is from Microsoft. The other one is from uh, Red Hat in cooperation with, uh, with the Azure team and uh, both run on 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 azure um today i'm going to talk about especially around uh, about app services um container apps azure functions and uh azure kubernetes service um i will just uh, uh talk about a little bit about the other services but not too much um i think these are the main deployment targets for for job applications nowadays um, only if you have uh, uh, Spring, then uh, Azure Spring Cloud is also a viable option. Um, I will show lots of uh, hands on how to deploy it. I also have some slides, but um, these are most uh, that uh, most for you there that you can look up the facts later. 
So let's start with the with the first service, App Service. Um, it's a pass solution, and yeah, just we just look at it, and um, uh, I, I think you can get most of it if you look at the user interface of 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 Azure. So um, what I did before the talk, I have here um, a resource group deployed with a lot of services in there. Um, I saw that there's a new resource visualizer. And in this resource group, um, I have deployed different services. Um, um, I have the bicep deployment uh, file um, also available uh, in my GitHub repository for later. Okay, the deployment over doesn't work. So I have AKS, um, application insights, and so on. And uh, down there, we have uh, two app services. And uh, with the app services, you have two possibilities. You can either run Java directly, or you can run a Docker container with Java inside. So let's have a look at the Java thing first. Um, app service has a lot of options on the left-hand side. When you look down there, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, most of the basic stuff you can go on the configuration, uh, do in the configuration, but you can see there is also some new stuff coming like service connector where you can connect to databases and the passwords are automatically injected like that. Um, you can also, of course, use managed identity. Um, up there you have identity, application insights, you have an authentication in uh, integration so that you can have an authentication provider outside of your application. Um, you can have custom domains um, with automatic um, SSL certificates, so you don't have to uh, create the certificate. So this is all done by Azure. Um, you have special networking settings where you can put the, um, the, the, the app service in a VNet and then just uh, talk to private databases and stuff like that. Uh, you have access restrictions from the outside where you can uh, do IP filtering or region filtering and stuff like that. So, there's a lot of lot of features there in in the app service that um, um, that uh, got there over the years. Yeah, um, the one thing that's a bit special about the app service is so it's not like a simple pass solution. Um, you always have to you always have two components in there. One is the app service plan and the app service itself. So uh, when you look here. Um, then you go over to the app service plan and the app service plan you can think about it is like a virtual machine or something like that but it's fully managed and on one uh, app service plan you can uh, deploy multiple applications so in this case i have one app service plan um, and uh, there is the docker and the java version running in this in this plan and the plan has um has something like a, a CPU and RAM associated with it. So you can choose between different sizes of the of the app service so that you can deploy uh, bigger or smaller applications. And you can also scale out the app service plan, but usually you, ha you have to scale the whole plan. So it will be a copy of all the apps that are running on one plan. There's a special feature that uh, makes it possible to only scale uh, single apps, but um, the scale can only be like uh, when you have two app service plans, you can maximum have two instances of your application. You can also say that uh, for one of these applications, I just want one uh, uh, one instance. So from the scaling factor, it's not that uh, flexible, but um, for most of the simple applications, um, the app service works quite well. Um, so let's head over to a bicep file. How would you deploy such an app, app service plan? Um, the first thing is here, like quite easily, just deploy a, a app service plan. It's called server farms in uh, in in the ARM version or in the ARM naming. And uh, here I deploy the server farm, and it's this uh, size. And the interesting thing is when you want a Linux uh, version, because there's a Windows version and a Linux version. Uh, the, the switch between Windows and Linux is reserved true is <laughs> Linux and reserved false is Windows, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, you see that there is some legacy going on there, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, so this is um, the, the app service plan. And then you can uh, deploy the app services itself. For example, here is the, the, the Java app service. Uh, you just have the, 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 you can reference the app service plan down here. And then again, you have the location. Um, I added a managed identity. We can go to this later. And then we have a site config. And here you say, okay, Linux FX version is the, the name for how you change, uh, switch which platform you use. And uh, in, this, in this case, I say it's a Java platform and I want Java 17 in this case. 
And then you have um, all the other properties in there. For example, um, I also put in there application insights. We have a look at applications insights in a minute. And then I can set other properties like HTTPS only and stuff like that. When I deploy this, um, I get exactly um, this app service plan and this app service here. So now I have the app service, but usually when I just deploy the app service, I have get an empty app, nothing is deployed there yet. Um, how would I um, deploy an app there now? There are different ways you can deploy an app. For example, there's a Maven plugin, Java, one of the biggest uh, Java built thing, systems is Maven. I think there's also a Gradle plugin for that, um, but you can also use the Azure CLI for that. And I have a simple script here that just deploys the, the web app. So you go a, a, a Azure Web App Deploy, you give it the resource group, uh, you give it the application name, and then you give it a char file in this case. This is a Spring Boot application. And uh, you say which which one which type you have, if it's a char file or a zip file or a war file. And with, with this commando, you can just um, deploy the web application. Um, and when you've done that, um, you can, I did this just right before for the talk, then you can open it. And uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's this uh, Java um, real life demo application. Um, and uh, you, you also find the source code in, uh, of this application in my Git repository. So when you look here at the Git repository, um, uh, I think I can uh, show it where the chat now. Also, um, here's, the, here's the source code of the application and then it's quite a simple Spring Boot application um, that has some uh, services in there. And uh, I, I'm gonna use this example to deploy to different technologies now. Okay, so now we have the application running and uh, all the other magic uh, that is done in the platform uh, was done by Azure. So uh, Azure put this in a, in a JVM and ran the JVM and uh, you just deploy the char file or the war file. And you can uh, say if you want to uh, run it as a char file or as a Tomcat, uh, as a war file in Tomcat. Um, one neat thing about uh, App services, you have uh, some SSH functionality. So you can go inside your application and there look around um, what, what's in there. So here I can go like LS and I, I also can say uh, top or something like that. And I see that here is my Java application running. And I can do it anything that I usually can do um, in a normal um, Linux shell here. Uh, which is quite good for when, when you have some troubleshooting or, or special things to do. Okay, okay. Um, what, what I also forgot is um, um, when you need storage, you can also uh, mount uh, storage here under the configuration. You can have um, a storage account mount and you can mount uh, storage, uh, persistent storage in, in, the, in the application that is shared between all instances. So this is how you would deploy a Java application with the Java version of, of, um, of Azure. Um, and I also have uh, the Docker version in there. Um, it's right below there. And here you can see that uh, instead of Linux FX version Java, you say Linux FX version Docker, and then you just give it the Docker image. The rest is quite the same. Uh, one thing to notice is uh, you have to set the port of the Docker image. Um, otherwise, it uh, it will um, require it to run on port 80. And usually, um, Java applications run mostly on port 8080, so you have to set this as well. And uh, what you get with that is um, quite the same application. It's right here. And as you look, the result is exactly the same. Um, the only difference is now when I go into in there and say SSH, um, it doesn't work. You will soon see the error here because um, the Docker container, when, when you run it on Azure and you want to have this SSH enabled, uh, has to have some special feature enabled. It has to have um, a, a SSH daemon running on port two, uh, 2222 
um, with a special password set. So that's the, the, the Azure runtime can uh, make an SSH connection in there and you can have a shell. So you have to add it to your image uh, manually so that this will work. Um, as I said, the rest is uh, exactly the same uh, with Docker and the Java version. We come uh, later to some, some gotchas and stuff like that. So let's go on with the talk. I think uh, I've said everything about that. You can also have API management and, and all the all the other stuff. Oh, what I forgot is uh, you have some blue-green deployment in there. So you have, can have multiple versions of the applications running side by side, um, uh, looking at the new version of the application already for in, with an internal UL, URL, and then you can switch over. You can also split traffic between those, uh, which is also quite handy. Um, but uh, web apps has also some downsides. Um, we had some issues with the app service Java runtime stack. Um, they did some patch updates and uh, Java did not start after that. Uh, the application did hang and it was a standard Spring Boot application. So even a standard Spring Boot application, which was created with started Spring.io wouldn't start. So um, um, I think maybe there should be a bit of, little bit better testing and 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 quality assurance in the in this image maintenance and they are usually also quite very slow with updates so um, for example the, there is an app insights agent running in this uh, in this uh, container that is created by Microsoft that runs your Java app without docker and the app insights version is usually uh, quite old like a a half a year or at least. Um, so if you want to have the newest features and stuff like that, um, I recommend that you deploy your own image. And then you also have all the benefits of Docker. You can test it locally. You have exact the same uh, instance running in the cloud. Um, and uh, here I put in the links for uh, SSH support and for Java agent support. So it's quite easy to create a good Docker image that also has um, these features available. OK, so this was about app services. And, and and then let's uh, go on to container apps. Um, container apps um, is a, a really, really new feature. Or, and with that, um, you have uh, like a Kubernetes cluster, but you don't have to to cope with the Kubernetes stuff. Uh, you just deploy your container and it runs. Um, it also has some nice features in there, uh, like Kubernetes event-driven autoscaling um, that scales your app on, on load. And um, yeah, and, uh, and you also have Dapper, that's a distributed apps runtime that's quite good to interact with different uh, services like when you want a Redis or some other stuff in there and you don't want to have to integrate it in your application itself, then you can use Dapper for that. And it has it on secret store. So let's look at uh, container apps in, um, in the Azure platform. So, Container apps always have a, has a container app environment and then also the container app itself. Um, container apps that are in one environment um, uh, can share a, a little bit of internal networking between each other. And one container app, you can think of one container app as kind of a, a pod, like uh, there's multiple containers running in one container app in, in there. Um, so let's have a look at, uh, at the container app itself. Uh, in the container app, um, you have different kind of um, uh, configurations. Um, you can have uh, also this um, external authentication uh, stuff going on there. And um, you can also see that uh, there you can have secrets, you can have ingresses. So this is quite similar to, 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 to Kubernetes, but it's also quite different. Mm. 
what is quite interesting is um, that you have kind of a revision management. You see all the old uh, deployments that were running before. Um, and uh, below here under containers, you can see the containers that are currently deployed. So you can go in here, edit and deploy. Uh, you can create new revisions. You can scale it differently. And you can also uh, set different CPU counts and CPU memory and stuff like that. Um, when I tested it, um, the, this, this is because the, the, the values are so high here. My application, or this demo application, usually starts with 1 or 0.5 core and uh, around 600 megabytes of RAM. But in container apps, uh, it, it doesn't start with that. It needs at least 2 gigabytes of RAM. Most of the time, it needs 4 gigabytes of RAM to even start. And we're not sure I have uh, um, um, an issue open there with, uh, with the Microsoft support. Let's see um, what they say about it. Um, so yeah. We can also have look at the, at the deployment um, manifest. So here you have the container app environment. Um, you can also hook it up to a log analytics, uh, um, log analytics workspace where all the logs from the containers are shipped. And um, and then we have the container app itself. And there you can see uh, there's different revision modes. Uh, revision modes means that uh, with with a single revision, there's only one revision online. With multiple, you can have multiple versions online, and you, then you can also do the split traffic. You can put uh, a little bit of percent traffic to one and percent traffic to the other. Um, yeah, then you also, also set the port and, of course, the container. And there you see a template. It looks a little bit like Kubernetes, but not so so 100%. Uh, but uh, it's quite familiar for the, for the people who, who work with Kubernetes. Then you have container name. Uh, the image and again um, environment, and here you can see um, that um, CPU and memory um, can be set as well. Um, I've overwritten them in in the in the portal so that the application starts. Um, the interesting thing about uh, container apps is the auto scaling option. So this thing uses Kida for auto scaling. So you can go in here and say min replica zero, and as soon the first request comes in, it starts the application and uses only uh, uh, resources when the application is running. And when there are uh, for a little bit of time there are no requests in there, the application is going down again uh, to zero, and you don't pay uh, you pay a lot less than um, than when an instance is running. This is especially good for cloud native services that uh, are up fast and. Uh, and also for services that don't need to run all the time, for for example, some internal application that just runs for for a few people and stuff like that. So this is quite quite handy, and uh, you save a lot of uh, of money with that. Okay, so this is the container app. Um, as I said, Kida is uh, is here for auto scaling, and uh, with Kida you can have um, a little bit of. Uh, um, not only the CPU, um, but uh, you can usually use like uh, the number of requests and stuff like that to uh, scale the application up and down. Kida is also an open source project, um, um, and you can deploy it to any Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so also to your um, AKS cluster or OpenShift cluster, or whatever. Okay, so that's uh, for the container apps. So let's see some drawbacks currently. Uh, currently, no custom domain support uh, is available. So you get, um, we can have a look at the container app again. You get this uh, really nice will for a container app, like this one. And uh, then you have, some, have to have some external stuff like a Azure front door or a cloud front or whatever, cl uh, cloud flare or whatever to put in front of your application to have a nice URI. Um, or you can also use API management in, in front of, um, of that. Um, uh, another big problem currently is little visibility. Is you, um, the logs are shipped to log analytics. You can't tail logs. Uh, you can't go inside a container, which you can do with Kubernetes. You, you can't, a lot of things that you can do with Kubernetes, a Docker container and other stuff, you can't do that with container apps. So. Um, Let's see how the future uh, is coming there. But currently, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's not so good for developer experience. Uh, it's, it's good for running stuff that is already major. But when you, when you need to debug stuff and find issues, it's, it's not very easy. 
Um, and it has no Kubernetes 2 support. Um, so you can't do kubectl logs or kubectl exec or debug or whatever. Um, you only get this with a, a real Kubernetes cluster. And as I said, uh, there's currently some kind of issue with the with the scaling and memory uh, thing so that the application uh, uh, doesn't come up even with uh, the, the nearly three times the amount that it currently needs on an AKS cluster, for example. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the next service, um, Azure Functions. Um, Azure Function is a is a is a serverless platform, a, um, a function as a service platform for .NET, Node, Python, Java, and PowerShell. And actually, it supports any language um, when you look at custom handlers. So with custom handlers, you can just run any binary. Um, and uh, this is what the talk before showed with uh, with Rust. So you can go with Rust or Go or whatever language you like and uh, and deploy with that. Or you can also run any Docker container. But uh, with the Docker containers, you can't have the serverless, uh, uh, the serverless version of it. You have to have like an, an app service instance where the Azure function is running on. Um, yeah, it can be serverless or an app service uh, plan and um, custom handlers and GraalVM native image are, are a match made in heaven. Um, I, I, I'll show you my, my demo in a second. So let's have a look at, uh, at Azure Functions, how this looks. Uh, with Functions, you also have an app service plan. So you have this app service plan. In this case, it's uh, it's a serverless plan. So you 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 have uh, no real uh, no real settings there. You just say it's a consumption based plan. Um, so you just pay when a function runs, and uh, you don't have a lot of configuration in there. You can also use a classic um, app service plan and then deploy your function in there. And so you can have multiple functions on uh, on on one app service plan. And then there's uh, the function app. Um, and the function app is a little bit different to, to Lambda because uh, a function app has multiple functions in there. And um, the whole function app is always started and uh, uh, scaled up and scaled down. So in this case, usually it, it needs a little bit more for the startup time for the, for the cold start. But um, with multiple functions, the probability for a cold start is a lot, a lot less than with AWS, AWS Lambda, where each function is its own runtime environment. Um, yeah, and um, when you deploy the function, uh, you can see, okay, your function is up and running. And then uh, you can, for example, this is also from this uh, application, um, you can call API calls. They're like API articles. That's that's the same call that um, that the, the application, the other application, is doing from the front end. Yeah, you have uh, a lot of the features that the app service has, like config, uh, conf authentication, application insights, identity, TLS settings, and so on and so forth. You can also have custom domains for that. Um, you can also have um, API management in front of that. So um, most of the time, you're gonna maybe need this if you're providing an API. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the version of a, uh, the simple thing of a function app. So let's have a look how you, you would deploy a function app. Um, what I want to show is uh, how you would uh, deploy um, a serverless function app. So in this case, uh, 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 cloud, uh, cloud VM native function app, I have this um, built the same application as a GraalVM native image. So uh, with GraalVM, you can uh, build Java applications so that you only get one um, binary. So I can just simply run this. So here is the, here's the app and it, I can simply run it. It, it starts in 0.5 seconds. It's pretty quick and you don't need multiple files uh, for a JVM and other stuff. So it just builds everything into one thing and it's, it's fast and it needs a really little amount of memory. And uh, with a custom handler, you can run this as a function app. Here you see that I just run this binary and I also additionally set the server port function. The function runtime gives me the port number I should listen on. And I also set this enable forwarding HTTP request. That means that the function runtime will forward the original HTTP request and doesn't uh, put it in a special Azure function uh, envelope. 
and I have to respond with a, a plain response, not in an Azure function envelope. Uh, it has some benefits so that I can reuse code, but it has some drawbacks that um, you can't integrate with messaging and stuff like that. So, but for simple applications, this can um, work quite well. And then I have also a script in there, deploy function. And I use the func as uh, CLI in this case, func Azure function app publish, and then the function name. Um, I get the function name again from the Azure CLI dynamically here. So yeah, with that, you, I just deployed the app, the, the function, and uh, you can simply access this um, by the portal. Yeah. One drawback of uh, of functions is that you can't have like custom paths. So you can't have like API articles one to three or something like that. You have to pass all the parameters after the articles either in the body with a post or if you want to have a get, you have to pass it as uh, get parameters. Um, so you can't have a real nice restful API with, with Azure Functions. Um, if you want to have that, you have to put a Azure um, um, API management in front of that and then you can also of course, remap the URLs, and then you can do anything you want. Um, what's also not uh, possible is you can't have uh, like a, a root um, folder. So when I just open the, the function with slash, I just get this your function app is running uh, thing, but I can't put an index HTML in here and, and run it. Um, so you have to have static web apps or blob storage with public access, and you have to combine this with the Azure functions. Static Web Apps even includes functions, but it, I think it can't run cust uh, um, the custom runtime one. So yeah, um, if you want to have Azure Functions, you have some drawbacks there, but you can yeah you can do uh, the, the things you can do with functions. Okay, then uh, on to Kubernetes. Um, yeah, Kubernetes is a standard solution. It runs on every cloud. Um, there are excellent tools. You can do kubectl logs, exec. You can go into the container. You can debug a container. You can do port forwarding from locally down to the container and stuff like that. So you can do anything you, you want. And uh, Azure has uh, two excellent services in there, Azure Reddit OpenShift and Azure Kubernetes service. Um, let's have a short look at there as well. Um, the main issue uh, with Kubernetes is that uh, I deployed it in AKS here. Uh, that usually you have to ha have your own ingress controller. So um, with my demo, I set up an ingress controller in there as well. So when we go in here, uh, we see that there is also the Nginx ingress controller with a public IP running. And um, and if you if you want to uh, run it, then you have to also put something in front of that. Uh, in, I put Cloudflare there, and and then you can access the app as well here. Um, so yeah, this is this is how it works. Uh, this is how you can go into the cluster. Um, with AKS, you have lots of uh, additional features. The same thing with uh, Azure Reddit OpenShift, but I think this could be a, a different talk just to talk about the difference between those. Yeah, as I said, drawback is uh, Ingress and Search Manager have to deploy it on your own. So or, or you have to have an application gateway, which is also a bit complicated to integrate and deploy. Um, but Ingress and Search Manager are quite major now and can easily deploy it with one Helm command and uh, work quite well. With Search Manager, you get automatic certifi certificate management for SSL and stuff like that, which is quite nice. And you have to manage, uh, upgrade the cluster manually or semi-manually. And you have, especially like the, if components in there, like the ingress controller and search manager you deploy, you have to update them. Uh, Nobody is doing that automatically for you. Um, with OpenShift, um, you have uh, some advantages, advantages there because OpenShift has some operators in there which update the cluster automatically, but it has a big overhead for small clusters. And you have to pay for the master nodes as well. With AKS, you don't. Uh, AKS is uh, the master nodes or the control nodes are for free. Yeah, so I created a little matrix that's just uh, that's from from my point of view um, how you can do with the different services. Uh, there are now also the other services included. VMs, yeah, price is quite okay. It's quite uh, cheap. Dev experience is not very good. Operation maintenance is also very, also not very good. App service is a little bit more expensive. Dev experience is okay. 
maintenance is um, very, very good because you don't have to do anything actually. The same, the same with container apps. Container apps is, uh, I think, around the same price here. And uh, Spring Cloud is very expensive, but it's also quite good. If you're into Spring 100%, I think it's, uh, it's a good solution. Azure Function is quite cheap, but it can also be expensive. But I think uh, when you use it correctly for the correct use case, it's quite cheap. And dev experience is also uh, not very good um, because troubleshooting and debugging functions is not that easy and maintenance is quite easy. Um, the Azure solutions have a very good developer experience, but the operation experience is, yeah, you have to have some operations team running that. Okay, so um, what I also did, I, I put on the, the Azure calculator and calculated some prices there. And what I wanted to do, I just want to run an application with two vCPUs and eight gigabyte RAM. And I said, okay, what is the cheapest option with any of these services? Um, AKS single node cluster, or it's, it's the same price as a single VM. You just pay uh, when you have it reserved for three years, uh, 34, 60 euros. So that's quite cheap um, per month. Um, with the Azure, um, Azure App Service web app, you pay 52 euros. Uh, with with free reserved version and container apps, it's around 100 because there is currently no reservation. Maybe if there will be a reservation, then um, uh, it will be cheaper. And you also have the skating thing with the container apps. So it could be a lot cheaper if the application isn't running the whole time. Yeah, then uh, the, um, the bigger services, uh, Spring Cloud, um, which is quite expensive here. Uh, you have uh, around 600. 37 euros, and but you get um, twice the RAM. So um, I just calculated down the RAM. So I want eight gigabyte of RAM. So um, I would pay 318 euros for uh, one container that needs eight gigabyte of RAM. Um, and uh, Azure Reddit OpenShift Free Node Cluster yeah, um, is also quite expensive here um, with a lot of head, head up costs for the free reserved thing. But um, if you if you have a big data center and a lot of people running on that. Um, Azure Red Hat OpenShift can also be um, quite a viable option. Okay, so then we are through with the comparison. Um, what I also want to say is uh, there are some tips and gotchas that I got um, over the over the last two years uh, that I ran Java on Azure, and I want to share them with them with you. Um, one of the first thing I fell over is App Service and X forty four. App Service is, uh, is I think, the only proxy um, that I know that doesn't send X44 in the way every other reverse proxy does. Um, it uh, Usually, you just get the IP, but with uh, App Service, you get the port number in there. So you have X44 is the client IP plus the port number. Um, and all the Java apps, and I think all the Python apps and all the Ruby apps <laughs> won't get uh, is right. So if you ask, uh, what is my remote address, you get the remote address plus the port. Uh, and some libraries and frameworks won't cope with that. Um, um, App Service sends another header. It's called X client IP. And in this header, it only sends the IP. So you have to switch your configuration to use this uh, header. Um, yeah, uh, you just have to know when you're running on App Service that this will be the case. Um, another thing uh, I wanted to talk about is managed identities. Um, let's head back uh, for a short trip over to Azure Portal. Um, as I said, uh, some of the applications I did have managed identity in there. So there is the web app here, and it it's, talks to a PostgreSQL database that is also deployed here in Azure. And when you look at the configuration here, you see um, that um, um, there is a data source URL here, but um, there is no um, password. So um, the password is not set in, in your own uh, username. Um, and the password, the application gets via um, the managed identity. So I have as associated here a user-defined managed identity. And then I have uh, gave, gave the rights of the identity, the, 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 the identity, the right to access the PostgreSQL database. And uh, no Java application currently supports this out of the box, but with Spring Boot and Hikari, uh, this is one of the data sources that Spring Boot uses out of the box, you can quite easily create a, an own Hikari data source, which extends the data source. 
um, where you just put in uh, a little bit of code um, with the Azure Java uh, library, with the Azure Java API. Uh, you say, okay, I want a managed credential. And then when when uh, when the Hikari data source asks for the password, you just give it managed credential uh, get token, and that's it. Uh, only if the token ex is expired, otherwise you get the, the existing token. So this is uh, with this six lines of code or eight line of lines of code, your application doesn't need uh, any password to access the database. Uh, it's quite easy to integrate in your in your application frameworks in Java as well. Um, and with that, you can also talk to Azure SQL and Cosmos DB and all all the services that support managed identity. In this case, it's uh, PostgreSQL. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, the slides and um, uh, will be online as well, so um, I, I'll, I'll post the link later. Um, application Insights um, is also one of the very, very good services uh, I can recommend on Azure. So if you run an application, on a Java application, uh, put Application Insights in there. If you don't have already another solution like Dynatrace or whatever, um, uh, it has really good integration. It collects lots of metrics, uh, even more frameworks than Dynatrace does currently, and has, has a perfect micrometer integration. And yeah, I, I would just recommend it. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time there, so I can I can show you a little bit. There is one App Insights here deployed. And uh, currently, this is hooked up with all the applications. So we have like some fancy stuff like this application map where you can see uh, which, for example, these are the two Java web applications that are shown that are talking to the same um, PostgreSQL database. You can see, okay, there are 25 calls there and eight calls there. And then you can even drill in there and see uh, which SQL statements were, were, uh, were done there and, and so on and so forth, 25 samples. And here you can see, okay, this statement was was uh, put off and, and so on and so forth. So you can see a lot of things. Uh, the most valuable thing is like a failure analysis. You can see all the failures when there is an exception here in, in your Java application. You can drill down, see um, which application, which exception was, was raised. And you can even see um, um, which was the, was the was the trigger. So in this case, uh, slash error page was called and then and so on and so forth. So you can see a lot of, of things with, with one click and it helps a lot for debugging, debugging applications in production. The only drawback with uh, application insights, it's not that cheap. So you pay around uh, three euros per gigabyte ingest data. And the problem is that the ingest data is in JSON uh, unzipped, so this is uh, all, all all the metrics that are sent there are uh, sent via JSON, and uh, that's a lot of overhead. And so you're gonna, uh, if, with most of our applications, the the main the main pricing point in our in our um, uh, monthly bill is application insights currently. So the application is around the same as the database, around the same as application insights. Yeah, this uh, brings me to my. Uh, conclusion. Um, yeah, Azure has lots of options to run Java on, on it, and um, check your use case, what you want to do, and 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 then choose choose wisely what what uh, which one uh, which type of deployment you want to do. I think uh, Java on Azure is quite awesome. It it works quite well, especially App Insights. The agent is really really good. Um, um, what I didn't tell you, you can also use App Insights outside of Azure. So you can put it on your on-premise um, deployments and report the uh, data to Azure and use it just as a, as a cloud-based APM tool, uh, application performance management tool, um, which is also quite a, a good solution. So my recommendations uh, for deploying um, Java applications on Azure. Uh, for existing single apps, simple scaling application, use app service. Um, I would also recommend to use it with Docker. So don't use it with the with the platform service like you just where you choose like Python or Ruby or Java. Uh, use it with Docker so you have the confidence that your Docker image will also run there. Uh, put in the SSH uh, daemon, especially for uh, the Azure version and deploy it. It works well. And then you have a little bit of debugging possibilities there as well. 
when you have multiple apps or microservices and that are talking to each other, I think I would uh, recommend uh, Azure Kubernetes service um, or or app, um, or OpenShift. If you have uh, if you're an OpenShift or Red Hat company, uh, go to OpenShift. But um, uh, if you if you're not sure what to do, I think AKS is uh, the best option on Azure currently uh, to deploy Kubernetes. Um, if you have a new greenfield app, think about Azure Functions or even uh, container apps, uh, where you have like ap applications that scale automatically up and down, um, that uh, are fast in the startup and uh, and do do things well. So you can may also do a combination between uh, app service and function apps, so that you have the the stable version in one app service and the dynamic stuff in in Azure Functions. Um, Use application insights. I already said it, um, and uh, watch container apps. I think they will be um, quite a, a, a way, a replacement probably for even for app service. So um, you can have like Kubernetes features without the Kubernetes stuff. If they add just a little bit more debugging and 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 visibility in there, I think it would be uh, it will be a great a great service. And uh, I think. That can be a, a future basis for deploying any apps, actually, because it's container-based. Yeah, thank you so far. Um, you find the slides already on my homepage here, so um, they're already up. Um, there is the, the GitHub uh, repository where there's all the code in there. Um, I put in a readme. I will also finish readme um, after the talk so that um, you can also deploy uh, the function and the AKS cluster, um, how the ingress is deployed and, and everything in there. So I uh, say thank you again. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And um, I see you over in the um, in the in the talk uh, in the in the after talk meetup in room number two. So bye bye.